10, verses 1 through 13. But I must tell you something about this. To really get the meaning out of this scripture, you need to go back to about chapter 8 and read forward through 11.
God spoke it. It didn't become God's word when he spoke it. It was God speaking his word, God speaking his heart to us. And in that sense, the Bible is such an incredible book. And the more I've studied this whole idea of what it really means to be a follower of Christ, and when I, a number of years ago, came to understand that the word salvation, which is the, in the Greek word, is the word so-so. And uh, it's basically uh, an umbrella word uh, under which is stacked, almost in a progressive sort of way, a progressional sort of way, uh, it uh, describes to us this overwhelming thing. As I mentioned in this little note sheet, and for you who are first timers, I don't follow this. I just give this to you to go home and study on your own. In fact, one of our families, they use it as their daily devotional study guide, which I thought, well, that's kind of interesting. Uh, so anyway, you can take it home and uh, do with it what you choose. But uh, I, of course, obviously will be talking about this particular topic. But when we realize what Christ has done for us, uh, it's, it's incredible. When we committed our lives to Christ, we accepted his offer of salvation. In Acts 4.12 it says, There is salvation in no, 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 no other, no other one else except, and he said, There is no other name given among, among men under heaven by which we can be saved. There's that word again, saved. It's a word that a lot of people turn, turn their noses up because they think it's too primitive, it's too archaic, it doesn't say what it needs to say. We, they prefer words like being religious or being this or being that or being the other which unfortunately may be okay from a human standpoint, but it doesn't fit with biblical truth. So we always are finding ourselves in that position where we have to decide, am I going to believe what other people think and what other people say, or am I going to uh, believe what the Bible says? And so it has a lot to do with that. So when we, it talks about salvation, whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved, as, as Ray read just a minute ago. It's a word that tells us that when we commit our lives to Christ, First, the first thing that happens to us is he forgives us. He forgives us of our sin. But he also cleanses us. And then he redeems us. He buys us back from the market of sin. And he buys us back and sets us free. Sets the, rips the chains off. Takes us out of the marketplace. And sets us free. And then welcomes, him, welcomes us into his own family as a child. As a newborn. And you can go on through it about the third bullet point down, I think, on the front of the sheet. You see this incredible list of all these different things that God does when we commit our lives to Christ. And, and in Romans, the 8th chapter, verse 35, I think it is, Paul asks this inter interesting question. He says, who can separate us from this love? And then he says, you know, can hardship and tribulation and war and pestilence and even death and then he answers his own question. He says, no, I am persuaded that neither death nor life nor principalities or powers or things below or things above or things in the past or things in the future, none of this can separate us from the love of Christ, the love of God in Christ Jesus. And then he goes on in about, uh, I can't remember which verse it is, and he says, we are more than conquerors. We are overwhelmingly conquered. And one of those areas that is included in this package of salvation, as I mentioned, the salvation uh, as a whole is sort of like a multifaceted diamond, been precision cut. Steve used to dabble in that sort of precious jewels in, in the business. And, and uh, some of the great things that happen is when somebody can cut a diamond in a particular way, that is perfect to the nature and content of that diamond and then cut away in those ways so that these little facets and each facet just reflects and refracts an aspect of the beauty of God's salvation and what he's offered us. And one of those little facets over there that we sometimes either neglect or we, uh, uh, we uh, misunderstand is the subject of healing. And this is one of the things that is included. In fact, I remember years ago, uh, there used to be a big debate over whether or not healing was in the atonement. And they were, there were people that 
have said, well, healing is not included in God's act of salvation. That's just a separate thing that God does on occasion to heal people and so forth like that. And yet the Bible is very, very clear, as you'll see in the little sheep. Scripture after scripture after scripture that tells us that it's in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. In, in, in Isaiah 53, uh, 5, I think it is, it says something like this. He, he talks about, he says, you know, we've gone through all of this, that so we've had this, 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 this amazing work of Jesus Christ. And, and then it finishes up by saying, and it's by his stripes, by his scourging that we are what? Healed. Now, here's the problem that you and I face. We come from a lot of different backgrounds, church backgrounds. And we come and we bring with us a lot of different traditions. We also remember those moments when God miraculously intervened in our lives or the life of someone that we know and brought them back to health and healed them, either of an injury or a sickness or so on like that. But we also remember those stories when uh, the uh, special uh, uh, services and events became a sort of a uh, big top attraction uh, where everybody came and they came uh, to see somebody heal. They came to see somebody throw away their crutches and walk out and all this. And the sad part about it is that there is great truth in this whole subject of what it means to be healed. Now, I want to uh, not digress, but I want to call your attention to a passage of scripture in Luke chapter 4 because this I think has, we have to understand what this whole idea of healing is, is all about. There are different types of healings and there are in fact if you were to look in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 where Paul describes the spiritual gifts, the gifts of the Holy Spirit when you come to that particular, in all of the different gifts, they are singular in nature. He says the gift of such and such, the gift of mercy, the gift of uh, knowledge, and so forth. But when it comes to healing, it's in the plural sense, gifts of healings. Both are plural, multiple gifts, different types of healings. And so that tells us something very, very important. And first of all, it tells us that God uses healing or uses many different resources and aspects in order to bring healing. Sometimes it will be an instantaneous, miraculous thing. Other times he will use a doctor or he'll use medications or, he, or he'll use dietary changes and nutritional changes. Uh, there are many different gifts by which God brings healing to us. But there's also, there are different types of healings. There's not just the physical healing, and I've always been fascinated by why we get so excited about being healed physically, and yet we don't pay any attention to some of the other areas of healing. And I wonder if at some time, in fact, I was thinking about this earlier this morning. Why is it that we think that having our bodies healed is more important than having our emotions or our memories or our relationships healed? Why, why should we not, why shouldn't we be as excited about a relationship between us and another person that's been fragmented or been damaged? Why, why shouldn't we be excited about that type of healing where there is reconciliation and, and, and or what about the memories and all the baggage that many of our, many of us sometimes carry with us where we've been abused or hurt or, or been, been talked at and, 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 re, and, and ridiculed and put down. Why aren't we as excited about those areas of our lives being healed? Because, quite honestly, those are the areas of our lives that live on eternally. Our bodies eventually die. Isn't that interesting? So when we hear people like me say, well, I'm going to preach about healing, the first thing goes through our minds is, uh oh, he's going to call to work, we're going to pray for everybody to be physically healed. No, that's not the point of healing. It's gifts plural of healings. Now, Going to this passage in Luke chapter 4, this is at the very beginning of Jesus' ministry. He has just come out. John in chapter 2, uh, John baptized, John chapter 1, John baptized Jesus at the Jordan River. And then after he had done that, then he, 
Jesus and his disciples go to Jerusalem and they get in a squabble at the temple uh, and Jesus clears out the temple. That's he does that twice, once at the beginning of his ministry and once at the end just before he's crucified. And then they go on and they come back and they, they head back from Jerusalem then back up. They go to the Jordan River, it says, where Jesus uh, baptized Dana and Mary will remember this because we were doing this in our study of the Gospel of John over at the park on Wednesdays. But uh, when Jesus finally comes back to Nazareth, which was his hometown, uh, when, he, when his parents brought him back from Egypt as a baby, uh, following Herod's death, they settled in Nazareth. And uh, Jesus became a well-known person in that area because he uh, was a part of the leadership of the synagogue there in town. And as a result of that, he had certain responsibilities that came along periodically. And apparently at this particular time, uh, it was Jesus' turn to read scripture. And so we pick this up in uh, chapter, well, in, in uh, chapter 4 of Luke and uh, verse 14. It says, Jesus returned to Galilee in the power of the Spirit, and news about him spread through all the surrounding district. And he began teaching in their synagogues, and he was praised by all, and he came to Nazareth where he had been brought up. And as was his custom, he entered the synagogue on the Sabbath, and he stood up to read. And the book of the prophet Isaiah was handed to him. And he opened the book, and he found the place where it was written, The Spirit of the Lord is upon me, because he has anointed me to preach the gospel to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim release to the captives and recovery of sight to the blind, and to set free those who are oppressed, and to proclaim the favorable year of the Lord. And he closed the book, gave it back to the attendant, and he sat down. And the eyes of all in the synagogue were fixed on him, and he began to say to them, Today, this scripture has been fulfilled in your hearing. That's the way Jesus introduced his public ministry. And as they, the people were filled with mixed emotions, some of them were praising him, and it talks about how they were amazed at the authority with which he could open the scripture and explain it. And yet at the other time, at other times, he was saying things that was totally counterproductive and was opposite of what their religious upbringing had, had, had taught them. And it says they became very, very angry. And they tried to throw him out. In fact, even as early as this, at the very beginning of his ministry, we, have, we see the evidence that there were people that wanted to kill him. So... But in this passage of scripture, here's what I want you to understand. He is quoting from the prophet Isaiah, chapter 61, the first three verses. You'll see that it's very, very, almost identical what Jesus uh, said here. And in this passage of scripture, Jesus introduces why he came. He, it shows us very clearly why he came. And the first thing it says, in fact, there's about five things that he mentions here. One of them is he came to preach the gospel to the poor. Now, what is the word gospel? It means good news, great exciting news. There's something new. You see, the gospel, as they understood it then, as Ray read from the scripture today, was that your righteousness came based on your ability to keep the laws of God that he had given to Moses and the children of Israel in the wilderness. But all of a sudden, Jesus is crying, coming to preach another, not another gospel, but to preach the true gospel, which is the just live by faith. Paul talks about this in Romans chapter 4 when he looks at the life of Abraham. Paul raises the question. He says, was Abraham made righteous before God by keeping the law? He says, no, it's not possible. Nobody can keep the law. In fact, you remember there's a story of the rich guy that came to Jesus one night, and, or one day, and he's, it, Jesus was talking to him about what it means to have a personal relationship with God. And, and uh, the first thing the guy says to Jesus, he says, hey, man, listen, I, uh, I kept all the law from the day of my childhood. So God ought to Accept me, right? <laughs> and uh, Jesus said, uh, well, if you even look on a woman with lustful thoughts, you've not only broken that commandment, but the end repercussion is you've broken all ten. This is why in Romans 3.10 it says there's none righteous. No, not one. Not one. And that's another 
another quote from the book of Isaiah. And so Jesus came to preach the gospel to the poor. Now in the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus makes this observation. He says, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of God. Jesus is not talking about people who are financially poor. He's talking about people who are poverty-stricken spiritually. Everyone who is thirsty and hungry, come. That's what he's saying. And so that's one of the reasons that Jesus came. And he goes on then and he says, I also came to proclaim release to the captives. Well, he's not talking about people that are in some kind of quote, Babylonian captivity in another country someplace. He's talking about people who are emotionally and mentally and physically imprisoned by habits, by thoughts, and by attitudes that they can't control. He said, I came to set them free. And then the third thing he says is I came to give recovery of sight to the blind. It's interesting, isn't it, that, so, that uh, so many of the miracles that Jesus performed, there's about 66 or 67 miracles that are recorded in the, in the four Gospels. And the overwhelming number of them had to do with people who are blind. You know, when Isaac Newton wrote this great old song, Amazing Grace, How Sweet the Sound, what does he finish his uh, last verse with? I once was blind, but now I see. I was lost, but now I'm found. Paul tells us in the book of 2 Corinthians that the God of this world blinds the eyes of those who are trying to understand the gospel so that in order for them to not see the light of the glorious gospel and come to, and be saved. There is a, there, that spirit of deception and that carnal attitude of disbelief and refusal to accept the truth, that makes us spiritually blind. And yet Jesus says, I can give you sight. In fact, it's interesting in the book of Revelation, if you look at the, the, uh, the church at Laodicea in chapter 3 of Revelation, uh, it, uh, it says that you think that you understand and that you have great eyesight, but you're blind. He's, and he says, I have eye salve that will fix that. You see. And so we find again that Jesus has come to minister to us in a lot of different areas. He goes on then and says to set free those who are oppressed. To set free those that are being oppressed by other people. Have you, and, and, and we oppress people. Let me tell you the best, the, the easiest and most frequent way we do it is we, we beat people up with our words. Have you ever heard this little phrase? I remember this. My grandmother used to tell me this out on the farm in southern Illinois. And then my mother, of course, she reminded me, remind me of it all the time <laughs> as a little boy. Sticks and stones may break my bones, but words will never hurt me. Well, I can tell you, folks, that's a lie. It doesn't work that way. <laughs> words hurt. And we really do a job on people by the way we talk, the way we talk to each other. Let me just give you an illustration. We have four daughters. Oh, my goodness, our baby is going to be 54 years old. <laughs> uh, let's, let's forget about that. Uh, <laughs> but we, uh, our, girl, our first three girls were born real close together. Joanne spent her three summers in a row given in the hospital. She's, that's where she spent her vacation. <laughs> 1960, our daughter Cindy was born. 1961, it was in June. Our daughter Debbie was born in July of 1970. 62, one, and then Sherry was born in July of 1962, and then we took a break, and our other daughter came along about two and a half years later. Our third daughter, Sherry, was a dreamer, characteristic of third born. Uh, they, uh, they live in their own little world, and also Sherry was one that oftentimes tended to uh, mess up doing something. <laughs> she'd knock over a glass of water or she'd do this, that, or the other. And we got to a point, and it wasn't Joanne, it was me. And, and the girls, they kind of laughed and would chime in on it. Any, 
time somebody else made a mistake or goofed up or broke something, somebody, then we'd all say, uh oh, there, you just did a sherry. <laughs> well, we had no idea. We thought that was a joke. We had no idea how that was hurting Sherry emotionally. And it wasn't until later that uh, we realized what we were doing. And there are other things, of course, being an only child, I, by birth, am, uh, was a, a perfectionist. So everything had to be just perfect. You firstborn know what I mean. The rest of you really know what I mean. Uh, and uh, we, uh, I lost my train of thought on that one. But anyway, uh, we would, I would say things to our girls. Our girls would come home from school, and they were all very, very good students in school. And I remember one time, one of our daughters came home, I think it was our second born daughter, and she'd had all A's except for one B plus. And instead of praising her and honoring her about all of the great grades she got, I said, well, why didn't you get all A's? Now, that lets the air out of the balloon in a hurry. It takes away incentive. And it places in the heart of those children a sense that the only way my father will accept me and love me is if I do well. And so, it's a lie, of course, but that's what happens. So what I'm trying to tell you is that some of the greatest areas in which we need healing is in those wounds that have been placed upon us by unthinking, still love, but still loving people who care about us. And yet, we live that way. And we complain or we criticize. You know, I just saw a little thing on the news. I've seen many of these before, but there's one, I, I think maybe I was posted on Facebook or something, uh, of, of these uh, parents that got in a big brawl at their kids' ball game. Can you imagine such a thing? Well, I can. <laughs> I've never done it, but, but think about it. And think what happens to those little kids when they suddenly come to the conclusion that the only way that my dad is ever going to love me is if I excel in my sport. Or the only way that I do well is if I'm good in my business. Now tragedy, and I talked about this earlier this year already, folks, but, but the tragedy is that, that when we go through experiences like this, our perception of God and how he feels about us is determined by the kind of experience that we have with our earthly fathers. And if we have an earthly father that makes promises that he doesn't keep, then what do you expect from God? That God will make a promise to you that is bogus and he won't keep it. And if you have a father that expected you to live to be perfect and to excel and was displeased when you didn't, how do you think your attitude toward God is going to be? How will you see God? You'll see God in the same way. And it's those areas of our lives that we end up carrying around with us from our childhoods into our marriages and into our parenting and so forth and so on. No wonder so many people are going to prescription drugs and alcohol and to all kinds of other things. Even activities, even sports, even accumulating things in order to try to find some way to heal that wound because that wound has never been healed. It may have been healed on the outside, but it wasn't healed in the, on the inside. When, when my dad pastored a church in Granite City, Illinois, I saw it made the news here not long ago. We, Dad pastored a little church that basically made it a basic basement with the flat roof on top of it. And it wasn't until a year that they could build the rest of the building. But one of the things, this was during the Second World War. My dad, of course, was a very young man in his late 20s, early 30s when we were there. And he loved sports. And so the church had a ball team, softball team. My dad was quite good at whatever he did athletically. And for some weird reason, he decided to be the catcher on the team. Now, they had a rule that you couldn't wear spikes. But one day, one 
of the guys on the other team broke that rule, wore spikes, slid into home plate, and gashed my dad's leg along the shin bone. They went to the doctor, where the doctor poured in sulfur, powdered sulfur, which is what they used on the battlefield during the Second World War. And so he cleaned it out, poured the sulfur in, set his leg on fire, of course, and then he just wrapped it up and passed it. And over the period of weeks, that thing began to heal. And healed it over, he stopped wearing a bandage. And then one day, his leg started turning red and started getting streaks up and down his lower leg. It became obvious that his leg was infected. But on the outside, it looked great. So he went to the doctor, and without any kind of anesthetic, of course, he sliced it open, and then he began to clean that out. I always like to tell this story. <laughs> I love to see the looks on people's faces. Uh, but he began to clean it out with swabs. And then he poured more sulfur back in, wrapped it up, and then it healed. Many people carry wounds that are healed on the outside. But there's an infection deep inside. And if you don't take care of it, it'll ruin your life. And the thing that takes care of something like that is forgiveness. Bitterness destroys the lives of people. And until we come to a point in our lives where we're willing either to ask forgiveness or to offer forgiveness, those wounds that we carry from our past never heal. And so what happens is that, no offense to medical and psychiatric profession at all, I don't mean it this way at all, but those basically treat the symptoms. They never get to the root issue. When I was pastoring in Iowa in the, early, in the late 1970s, we had a lady in our church that came to me. She'd had tremendous emotional problems. She and her husband were very, very active in the church, and they loved each other. They had a couple of really nice boys. I mean, it's just a great family. But she had been, she had had serious psychiatric help in the past. And as she talked to me about that, she said, you know, I actually had shock treatments. This is when they were still doing electroshock therapy. And she said, Pastor, it always has puzzled me why as they gave me shock treatments and blotted out my memory, I still always remembered my sin. See, shock treatments don't deal with sin. They deal with symptoms. Only forgiveness and the blood of Jesus Christ will deal with my sin. So we have all these different things that go on. And I've digressed a lot from where I thought I was going to go this morning. But I knew that there had to be a reason why I was sharing this today because my normal, my, my original plan was to cover the last four of the 18 aspects of salvation. And then I told Joanne yesterday morning, I think I'm just going to do two. And by noon, I knew I could only do this one. So somebody here needs to hear this, I assume. <laughs> But I want you to look at some of the things. And, and healing, healing deals with a lot of different areas. It does include physical healing, but you'd be amazed at how many of our physical illnesses and problems that we have come as a direct result. They are psychosomatic. They, they come as a result of relational aberrations and relational conflicts that we've never settled. Sometimes they come from our own sense of unforgiveness of ourselves because even though we have accepted Christ and received his forgiveness, we've never been able to bring ourselves to the point of forgiving ourselves and saying, the blood of Jesus Christ covers me of all sin, you see. And we just need to be able to understand this. Now, you see on the sheet a list of biblical reasons why people are sick. 
physically, emotionally, spiritually. And you can read through all of that that you want to. But I just want to go back and just remind you that in the person of Jesus Christ, from the beginning of his, before he was ever born as a human being, the prophet Isaiah made it clear that he was coming as the healer, the healer of a nation, the healer of a people, the healer of a soul. And throughout, when he announced his public ministry that we looked at, we see all the different areas in which Jesus was willing and had announced, this is why I came, to heal you in your relationships, to set you free from that imprisonment that you put yourself in, and to be to release you to life the way I want you to experience it. And he said, I came to heal you physically as well. And so the last thing that we see is just some things to remember about biblical healing, and this is on the back of the sheet. You can read through all of these, but it's just important for us to remember a couple things. One is that God does heal, he can heal, and he will heal. We need to understand that healing comes not just physical, but also emotional, mental, spiritual, relational, financial. God is in the big healing business. It's a part of salvation. This is why scripture says, by his stripes, by his scourges, we are healed. This idea that healing is not included in the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ is an absurd thought. If it's not in Christ, then where in the world is it? You see, healing of all kinds has to come either through the person of Jesus Christ or it's an impossibility. Now, we also need to understand that when he, God heals us in whatever way it is, it is always through the person of Christ. This is why I feel so sad sometimes. I don't feel sorry for them. I feel sad for them. When I see people that are trying to deal with a lot of these wounds and scars, and yet they will not acknowledge that Jesus is the Son of God, or they won't even acknowledge that God exists. I wonder, how do they deal with that stuff? Well, they deal with it through drugs and activities and habits and all kinds of stuff. And they make a lot of psychiatrists and psychologists and medical doctors wealthy in the process. Now, I'm not discounting their role, because there are gifts, plural. And those gifts include the medical profession, it includes counseling, it includes nutrition, good nutrition, and so forth and so on. But God wants us to be whole. He wants us to be healthy spiritually. Third John, only one chapter, so I say chapter 1, verse, verse 2. John makes this statement. He says, my little children, I love John. He's one of my favorite gospel writers. He says, my little children, I, I write this, and I pray that you will prosper and be in good health just as your soul prospers. You ought to go back and read that. And all of a sudden we realize that our ability to prosper materially, physically, in other areas is dependent upon how healthy our souls are. Isn't that an amazing thought? So it's necessary for us to be sure that we are walking spiritually in the things of the Lord and that we are turning to his word and we are trying to be obedient to his word as best we can. In the 15th chapter of Exodus, you're, you're doing the same thing that you did last week. You're not listening nearly fast enough. <laughs> In the 15th, and I'll, I'll close with this, but in the 15th of chapter of, Je of Exodus, we have the second of eight covenant names of God. The word, they're built around the word Jehovah or Yahweh, which means Redeemer. Jehovah is our salvation. Yahweh is the same word from which we get Jesus. And uh, the first
first one appears in the 22nd chapter of Genesis when God, uh, when Abraham offers Isaac as a sacrifice and J Abraham finds the ram caught in the thicket, God says, offer this one instead of your son. And Abraham says, Jehovah Jireh, God provides. The second covenant word that we find in the Bible is in the 15th chapter of Genesis, or Exodus. And this is when the children of Israel are going through the wilderness. They come to a place called Mara. And the water there that they're about to drink is bitter. And Moses, by God's instruction, throws a tree of some kind into the bitter water. And the water becomes pure and clean. And God speaks to Moses and he says, If you will obey my commandments and my ordinances as I've commanded you, then none of the diseases that I poured out on the Egyptians will I put on you. S.I. McMillan was a medical doctor, a missionary doctor, who began to study the teachings of Torah and began to look at that verse of scripture and discovered that many of the diseases that you and I face today are the direct result of the violation of one of God's principles that are found in the book of Leviticus and Numbers and Deuteronomy. Now, when we talk about the, the laws of God or the commandments of God, we usually think of the Ten Commandments. But God gave Moses a whole array of commandments, laws by which to live. There were the hygienic laws that you were supposed to follow, how to, because that helps you stay healthy. There were dietary laws. There were relationship laws where certain conditions where you took a person to court or you reconciled. All of these, plus the Levitical, the sacrificial laws by which they had a right relationship with God. And so what God was telling Moses to tell the people was, if you will follow these laws, then you're not going to have to deal with some of the mental and emotional and physical diseases and illnesses that the Egyptians have had to deal with because they rebelled against me, because Pharaoh turned and rebelled Against, uh, against me and would not let you go. And so God, made, it's clear from beginning to end in Scripture, it's clear that Jesus Christ is an amazing healer. And he'll, he will heal, listen friends, he will heal for you anything and everything that you decide to give to him. He will. So if you're having a relationship issue with somebody and your family reunions look more like a wrestling match, <laughs> God can heal that. If you know somebody who is having deep emotional difficulty, one of the best things you'll ever do for them is to pray for them on a daily basis and pray that the uh, the, the, the blinders will be stripped away from their spiritual eyes so that they can see and understand what God is all about. And what, you know, what do you think the Sermon on the Mount's all about? Go back and read the Sermon on the Mount. Read the Beatitudes. It describes the kind of life that Jesus came for us to have. And we can have it. When we acknowledge that he's not only our Savior and Redeemer, but he is the healer. He's the one who can heal broken hearts. You know. Well, you're going to have to read the rest of it yourself. <laughs> but I, my, I, I just hope that we understand how, how great the salvation is. That, that when, when Christ saved us, he did so much more than for us to be forgiven of our sins and have eternal life. But he offered us a life, not just eternal life, but a lifestyle by which we can live and by which we can prosper, just like John said, that you can prosper. Now, that doesn't mean to become materially wealthy. It basically means to be successful and be in good health. But it's in direct relationship to the condition of our soul. 
So what's our spiritual condition? Are we skeptical about God? Do we neglect to spend time in his word? Do we not spend time in prayer? Do we not fellowship with other believers? Do we tend to judge others because they don't have the same catechism or the same doctrine that we have? Or do we come to him and realize that Jesus is himself described as the great physician? You know. There's a little chorus that I thought of yesterday. And I don't know if any of you know it or not. Diane just tried to learn it a little bit ago. But it's, the words to it are written on the inside of your bulletin, your uh, order of service. His name is Jesus. Jesus, I want you to look at those. Sad hearts, weep no more. He has healed the broken hearted. And an open wide the prison doors. He's able to deliver evermore. Now, since some of you don't know it, or probably many of you don't know it, I'm just going to sing it as my last point, and then I'm going to let Diane come up and lead us as we sing it another two or three times through. You just want me to do it? Joanne's going to play. Relax. Okay, so I want Joanne to play the word, play the tune, so you become familiar with the tune, and then I'll sing it for you, and you can follow along. It, it's easy to easy to learn. <laughs> Lead 
use in our benediction. And I hope your heart's been encouraged this morning. Thank you, Pastor Bob. Once again, here we are. Once again, we leave uh, full of spiritual food. Our benediction this morning is from uh, the 15th chapter of Romans. Now may God, who gives perseverance and encouragement, grant you to be of the same mind and one another, according to Christ Jesus, so that with one accord you may with one voice glorify the God and Father of Well, we have lots of food in the back, so make sure everybody that's here goes into the back eventually and grabs something to eat before you go home. It's sometimes as good as lunch. <laughs> so we end our, so our uh, service today with the <coughs> family of God, which if you don't know the words, is on page 282, and we like to join hands with somebody and 